have died from this disease. 12.5 million Americans are out of work. Tens of thousands more children are living in poverty, going hungry because their parents have lost their jobs and can't afford to buy food. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses have closed their doors forever, shattering dreams and livelihoods. The White House has become a COVID-19 hotspot, driven by the President's ongoing denial of how serious this pandemic is. Not even contracting the virus and being hospitalized seems to have shaken him back to reality. In normal times, the Senate would be focusing our attention on passing legislation to help the millions of Americans suffering during this pandemic. But these are not normal times. Instead, Senate Republicans are rushing to put a nominee onto the Supreme Court to be the deciding vote to take health care away from millions of people. President Trump has been very clear about what he's doing. He's repeatedly promised to appoint Supreme Court justices who will strike down the ACA. And by nominating Judge Barrett, the president is keeping his promise. In her speech at the White House COVID super spreader event two weeks ago, Judge Barrett aligned herself with her mentor, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, who twice voted to strike down the ACA. To help the president keep his promise, our Republican colleagues are rushing to confirm Judge Barrett in a hypocritical, illegitimate process mere weeks before the election. They want Judge Barrett seated just in time to hear the Republican lawsuit challenging the ACA a week after the election. For Americans dealing with this pandemic, it must seem outrageous that Donald Trump and Senate Republicans are determined to take away their health care and are just as determined to do nothing to help Americans with a new COVID relief bill. And they're right. It is outrageous, but it's not surprising. Republicans have made it clear for the past decade that repealing the Affordable Care Act is at the top of their hit list. We know this because a mere two weeks after assuming control of the House in 2011, Republicans voted to repeal the ACA for the first time. And over the next six years, next six years, Republicans took at least 70 votes, 70 votes in Congress to eliminate provisions of the ACA or to repeal it altogether. These repeal efforts culminated in the early morning hours of July 28, 2017, when our late colleague, Senator John McCain, gave his dramatic thumbs down and saved health care for millions by one vote, his vote. Faced with their 70 failures to get rid of the ACA in Congress, Republicans have taken to the courts. Right now, the Trump administration and 18 Republican state attorneys general, including those from Texas, South Carolina, and Missouri, are at the Supreme Court right now trying to strike down the ACA. All arguments in the case are scheduled for November 10th, a mere week after Election Day. This latest legal effort has been turbocharged because of the death of our champion, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, only three weeks ago. Her death has changed everything for Donald Trump and Senate Republicans. They are confident that victory at the Supreme Court is now within their grasp if the Senate confirms Judge Barrett through this hypocritical, illegitimate process. The consequences of Judge Barrett's confirmation would be devastating for millions of Americans who would lose their health care during this pandemic. Even in normal times, without the threat of a pandemic, no one in our country should have to confront a major illness worried that it might bankrupt their families. But we all know these are not normal times. Health care is the number one concern for so many people in our country, and they are rightly terrified that Judge Barrett will provide the deciding vote to overturn the ACA and take away their health care. I want to share two of their stories today. Kimberly Dickens is from Raleigh, North Carolina. Before the Affordable Care Act, Kimberly couldn't afford health insurance. 
Thankfully, the ACA enabled her to get health care. She used that coverage to get a checkup and a mammogram, which found her breast cancer. With her health insurance, she was able to get a mastectomy and has been cancer-free since. Kimberly credits the ACA for saving her life. She said, quote, if it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act, I probably wouldn't have had that mammogram. I was diagnosed early. It scares me to think, if I didn't have insurance, how far advanced would the cancer have grown? Kimberly's story is not unique. In the years of all the battles of eliminating the ACA, we've heard from hundreds and thousands of constituents across the country sharing their healthcare stories. Dean Oda and his daughter Jordan are from my home state of Hawaii. Jordan, who is an elementary school teacher at Eva Beach Elementary School, has PNH, a very rare blood condition. To treat this condition, she gets infusions of a special medicine that costs around 500000 per year without insurance. Dean told me that, quote, without this medicine, she will die. Dean and Jordan live in fear that Republicans will strike down the ACA, which would allow her insurance company to put lifetime caps on her benefits, and she would be left without coverage for her life-saving medication. Dean wrote to me to share how, quote, extremely terrified he is about his daughter losing access to adequate health care under the ACA. He's asked me to fight for her, and that's what I'm doing today. Health care is personal to Kimberly, Dean, Jordan, and it's personal to me too, because I know that having health insurance and access to health care saved my life. On the day when the Senate confirmed Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, I got a routine chest x-ray before a scheduled eye surgery. A shadow on that x-ray and a later scan led to my diagnosis of stage four kidney cancer and gave me time to receive treatment. My diagnosis came as a total shock and I, I'm grateful it came when there was still time. I still have cancer but I don't need any treatment right now. I receive re regular scans so that I will know in time if treatment becomes necessary again. I'm grateful for the care I've received and continue to receive from my doctors. The cost of my treatment, which included surgery to remove a kidney, a second surgery to remove part of a rib replaced with a seven inch titanium plate, almost two years of cutting edge immunotherapy and regular scans has been enormous. It would bankrupt almost every family in this country if they didn't have health insurance. I'm not special or unique. Serious illness can hit anyone unexpectedly. It did for me. And when it does, no one should have to worry about whether they can afford care that might save their life. The Affordable Care Act provided this peace of mind for so many people over the years who found themselves in positions similar to mine. Their lives and their health are what's at stake. Their lives are what's at stake with this nomination. And at moments like this, where the health care of millions is on the line, I think back to the care and concern so many of you showed me when I was diagnosed with cancer three and a half years ago. So many of you, including many of my Republican colleagues on this committee, wrote heartfelt notes wishing me well and letting me know you were thinking of me. And to this day, when the chairman of this committee and I find ourselves away from the cameras or sharing an elevator, he never hesitates to ask me about my health, about he says, how are you doing? Mr. Chairman, you and I have had our pointed disagreements over the years, particularly during our time together on this committee. But your concern means a lot to me. Moments when we recognize our shared humanity are rare in Congress these days. But this can and should be one of those moments this can be a moment, Mr. Chairman, for you and your Republican colleagues 
to show the American people terrified about losing their health care the same care and compassion you showed me and continue to show me when I was diagnosed with cancer. Instead of rushing to jam another ideologically driven nominee onto the Supreme Court in the middle of an election when over 9 million Americans have already voted, Mr. Chairman, let's end this hypocritical, illegitimate hearing, return to the urgent work we have before us to help those suffering during this pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Rano. I think it's not just me. I think everybody on this committee and everybody that knows you knows you're passionate about your causes. We have a lot of political differences, but all of us are very encouraged to hear that you're you're doing well, and we'll keep praying for you, um, your asset to the Senate. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do the right thing. Okay. <laughs> Senator Ernst. Aloha. Aloha. Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Judge Barrett, thank you so much for being in front of us today. Welcome to you. And of course, I am so glad that you have had your family join you today as well. Only 100 years ago, women in this country were given the right to vote. And today, we consider adding another woman to the highest court in the land. And I can't help but be so proud of all of the every one of our women have accomplished in this incredible nation. This is the first time that I've been a member of the Judiciary Committee during a Supreme Court nomination process. And as you probably know, like most Americans, I'm not a lawyer. I bring a slightly different perspective onto this committee. But one thing is very important to me, and it's something that matters to Iowans, whether they are lawyers or not. I firmly believe in the role of our Supreme Court. It is the defender of our Constitution. At the end of the day, that's my test for a Supreme Court justice. Will you defend the Constitution? It frustrates me and it frustrates my fellow Iowans that the Supreme Court has become a super legislature for a Congress that frankly won't come together, discuss these tough issues, and do its job. What I hear from my colleagues on the left is about judicial activism and what they want to see in their nominees, which is that super legislature. They are projecting that upon you, Judge Barrett. That's what they are projecting as they talk about what cases may or may not come in front of the Supreme Court. Matter of fact, I think it was just the other day that Vice President uh, Joe Biden told the American people they don't deserve to know whether he is going to pack the court. They don't deserve to know who his judicial nominees would be. I think we do need to know. Again, because it's what the left is projecting on you today is what they want to see in their nominees. But that's not what our founders intended the court to be. I hope that this hearing will be an open, fair conversation about how Judge Barrett would be as Justice Barrett. I am concerned, however, that not everyone involved in this hearing shares that goal. We've already seen hints in that over the past few weeks, immediately attacking your faith and your precious family. Instead of entering into this nomination process with an open mind and a desire to understand this woman who has been nominated for the highest court in the land, the focus is on a plan or a strategy, a series of tactics to undermine, coerce, and confuse the American people. A plan, Judge Barrett, to undermine you as a person, undermine your family, and undermine what you hold dear. 
Women all over the world are painfully familiar with this strategy. We are all too often perceived and judged based on who someone else needs or wants us to be, not on who we actually are. I cannot speak for those that would attempt to undermine your nomination, but as a fellow woman, a fellow mom, a fellow Midwesterner, I see you for who you are. And I'm glad the American people have the opportunity to get to know Amy Coney Barrett. This week will be an opportunity to dig into your background further and understand more about your judicial philosophy. But what your political opponents want to paint you as is a TV or cartoon version of a religious radical, a so-called handmaid that feeds into all of the ridiculous stereotypes they have set out to lambast people of faith in America, and that's wrong. It might be less comical if this was the first time the left has trotted out this partisan playbook. Your political opponents have made these types of religious attacks on nearly every Supreme Court candidate nominated by a Republican president in the modern era. And every time, like clockwork, they say they really mean it this time, this nominee, this woman in front of us, she is the absolute worst. I'm struck by the irony of how demeaning to women their accusations really are. That you, a working mother of seven, with a strong record of professional and academic accomplishment, couldn't possibly respect the goals and desires of today's women. That you, as a practicing Catholic, with a detailed record of service, lack compassion. I know you to be compassionate. Your record on the Seventh Circuit says, says that you are. And more importantly, it shows that your demonstrated commitment is to defending the Constitution. The great freedom of being an American woman is that we can decide how to build our lives, whom to marry, what kind of person we are, and where we want to go. I served in the Army, something not exactly popular at various points in America's history. We don't have to fit the narrow definition of womanhood. We create our own path. Justice Ginsburg was one such woman, and I would like to pay tribute to her for what she did to pave the way for women of today. It's really quite simple what your opponents are doing. They are attacking you as a mom and a woman of faith because they cannot attack your qualifications. Every year, I travel to every single one of Iowa's 99 counties and talk to men and women from all walks of life. Whether they are farmers or nurses or small business owners, they want a government that is accountable to them. When Congress makes a law that oversteps the Constitution, the ripples can be felt, whether it's on farms in Montgomery County, where I'm from, and the manufacturing facilities of Dubuque. It can be felt in the church services of Sioux City and the community meetings in Waterloo. The Supreme Court's only job is to rule on the cases before it and defend the Constitution. To do that well, a justice needs to be thoughtful, restrained, and wise. Judge Barrett, so far I have seen all of those things in you. I am so glad that we have you in front of us. I look forward to learning more about you I want to thank you and your family for being in this nomination today. And certainly, this, folks, is what a mom can do. Thank you, Judge Barrett, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Behind me, Merritt Bowman is a 49-year-old father of twin boys, which you could see, and a football coach and paraprofessional at Deptford High School in New Jersey. 
For years, Merritt put off going to the doctor because he was, like many Americans, afraid he could not afford it. But when the Affordable Care Act was passed, he finally got the coverage he could afford. Four years ago, after not feeling well, Merritt made the doctor's appointment and was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, a disease that affects over 10% of Americans and disproportionately impacts black Americans like Merritt, who are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes and twice as likely to die from it. Today, Merritt takes insulin and other medications, and his condition has thankfully improved. Merritt said, and I quote, Obamacare made it so I was, was not afraid of the costs of going to the doctor. If I didn't have insurance and didn't get a diagnose, diagnosed, who knows where I would be right now? But Merritt is worried about what will happen if the Affordable Care Act gets overturned. He said, and I quote, now I have a pre-existing condition. My insurance covers my medications, my equipment to monitor my diabetes. If that's taken away from me, what's going to happen? I can't afford those on my own. Michelle Luris from Palisades Park, New Jersey, lost her husband John last year when he passed away suddenly at the age of 58. Michelle relied on health insurance through John's job, but when he died, their insurance went away. She was given the option to continue his plan, but she couldn't afford the cost of $800 a month. So Michelle signed up for coverage on the insurance marketplace, where she qualified for a subsidy that made it more affordable. Today, she's insured and she can manage her diabetes, heart disease, and an autoimmune disease because of her coverage. Like Merritt, Michelle also relies on insulin and other prescription medications. If the ACA was overturned, Michelle said, quote, I could lose my house if I didn't have affordable health care. I would have to sell my home. I like where I live. I don't want to lose my home. People like Merritt and Michelle are understandably scared right now. President Trump has told America he would end the ACA. He promised explicitly that he would only nominate judges that would do the right thing and eliminate the Affordable Care Act. People like Merritt and Michelle know what a future without the ACA looks like. It looks like 130 million Americans with pre-existing conditions, from cancer survivors to people with disabilities being charged more or denied coverage completely. It looks like 20 million Americans losing their access to potentially life-saving care in the middle of a pandemic that's already killed over 214,000 Americans. In New Jersey, we've lost six, over 16,000 people to COVID-19, 595,000 people would lose their coverage without the ACA. For millions of Americans, a future without the ACA looks like being forced to sell your house if you can't afford your health care. It looks like not having access to a doctor when you're sick. It looks like having to choose between paying for groceries and paying for medicine. And people are scared right now for another reason, because they know what a future without the protections of Roe v. Wade looks like, because President Trump has explicitly stated that he would only put up Supreme Court nominees that would overturn Roe v. Wade. He said it clearly, we should believe him. And that, without Roe v. Wade, our country looks like people being denied the ability to make decisions about their own bodies, not just while they're pregnant, but being stripped of the right to plan for their futures. It looks like women of color low-income women and women living in rural areas who can't just pack up and leave if abortion is restricted or criminalized where they live, it looks like them being left with no options. It looks like state laws proliferating throughout our country that seek to control and criminalize women. It looks like the government interfering with women making the most personal medical decisions. It looks like a country in which states may write laws that could subject women who have miscarriages to investigations to ensure they didn't have abortions. In America today, people are scared. You've heard from my colleagues. We are getting calls to our office 
where people are afraid. More than 214,000 Americans have died, many of them isolated and alone, away from friends and families. Tens of millions of jobs have been lost. One in three American families with children aren't getting enough food to eat. More than 100,000 small businesses have closed permanently. Lines at food banks in the wealthiest nation on the planet have stretched for miles. We could be as the Senate, we should be as the Senate, working in a bipartisan way to try to get this virus under control, to get relief to people who are hurting, who are struggling, who are afraid, to help people who are unemployed, to let doctors and nurses and hospital staffs putting their lives on the line right now in state after state where COVID is rising, know that we have their backs in a pandemic. But instead of doing anything to help people who are struggling right now, we are here. We're here. I'm, I'm so glad, I'm really glad that my colleagues who contracted COVID-19 at the Rose Garden Super Spreader event for Judge Barrett had access to the care that you and your families needed. That is right. This is a blessing. The problem is the people who will come through here today to wipe down the desks and empty the garbage, that will vacuum the floor like people all over our country who are working today in factories, teaching children in schools. They don't have direct line to the nation's top health experts. They can't show up to work sick. And they might not have space to distance themselves at home to protect their families. We literally stopped the Senate from functioning with the exception of this hearing. That's why we're here. We're not just 22 days from an election. We're in the middle of an ongoing election when millions of people have already started voting because Donald Trump and most of my Senate Republican colleagues know the truth. They won't be able to get away with this after the American people have spoken in this election. Donald Trump and my Senate Republican colleagues in this room today know that the American people don't want the ACA overturned. Donald Trump and my Senate Republican colleagues know that the majority of Americans actually don't want Roe v. Wade overturned. That the majority of Americans don't want to see abortion criminalized in our states. But that is exactly why we are here today, because Donald Trump and Senate Republicans know that the American people don't want this, so they have to act now. They don't trust the American people, which is so painful, because that's what they said. They said we should trust the American people and what the American people say under President Obama 269 days from an election. And then... After that election, they tried time and time again to overturn the Affordable Care Act, but a handful of Republicans stopped them. You see, they tried in the Senate. They tried in the House over 70 attempts to rip down the Affordable Care Act, but now Donald Trump has said explicitly he's going to do it through the courts by making the nomination we see here today. That's why we are here. The American people should know that that is what this is all about, rushing this nomination through to sit a Supreme Court justice in time to hear <clears throat> a case before the Supreme Court that will end the Affordable Care Act. We're here because in the middle of a deadly pandemic, in the middle of an ongoing election, Senate Republicans have found a nominee in Judge Barrett who they know will do what they couldn't do, subvert the will of the American people and overturn the ACA and overturn Roe v. Wade. That's what this is about. That's why we're here. It's very simple. Senate Republicans know the American people don't want this but they don't care because they have only one small window of opportunity to work the system, betray what the American people want. And so they're desperately rushing to complete this process before America starts voting, but they don't have to do this. If one of my colleagues will stand up on this committee, we can hold this over until after an election. If two of my colleagues on the Senate floor agree with their other two colleagues, Republicans, we can stop this. Otherwise, this is a charade when they say this is a normal judiciary committee hearing 
for a Supreme Court nomination. There's nothing about this that's normal. It's not normal that Senate Republicans are rushing through a confirmation hearing, violating their own words, their own statements, betraying the trust of the American people and their colleagues, and failing to take in this hearing even the most basic safety protections to protect people around them, all to ensure that tens of million people, tens of millions of people will lose their health care when we're seven months into one of the worst public health crises in the history of our country. It's not normal. This is not normal that millions of Americans like Michelle and Merritt are, are just scared of a deadly virus. They're scared of their fellow Americans who are sitting in this room right now. They're scared that their government and their institutions will be manipulated by people who could not work through the democratic process to take away their health care and are trying an end run to achieve that. Nothing about this today is normal. This is not normal. What is going on in America today in the midst of a deadly pandemic and an ongoing election, having a rushed Supreme Court nomination hearing is not normal and we cannot normalize it. People are voting right now. The American people should decide. The American people should decide. The American people should decide. I will not be voting to confirm Judge Barrett's nomination. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Mr. I, I would like to submit a letter for the record, if I may. Uh, would that it, it, it would, would, we should not be rushing, as I said, this process. Uh, my colleagues agree with me that we should be working to protect the health and safety of Americans across the country and taking the precautions, greater precautions in this workplace. I'd like to enter into the record a letter from Senators Leahy, Senator Harris, and myself that we sent to the chairman last week asking that these hearings not proceed without proper testing measures, without all of us being tested and a COVID safety protocol being put into place. Thank you. Without objection. Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Judge Barrett, welcome and congratulations on the high honor of your nomination. I have some prepared remarks here, which I will give, but uh, having sat through the speeches that I've heard already and listened to the attacks that have been made, both on Republican members of the committee and on you, um, I think it's important to just set the record straight on a few items before I then talk about why we are here, and that is you and your qualifications to serve as a justice. So what were the attacks? Uh, I'd say the first one is that we're rushing too fast and that we are, we are uh, violating the rules and norms and precedents of the Senate and speeding into these proceedings. Uh, what are the facts? Well, I had my staff check while we were sitting here. Uh, this, this hearing is 16 days after Judge Barrett's announced nomination. More than half of all Supreme Court hearings have been held within 16 days of the announcement of the nominee. This case is no different. A couple of examples. Justice Stevens, 10 days. Justice Rehnquist, 13 days. Justice Powell, 13 days. Justice Blackman, 15 days. Justice Berger, 13 days. These proceedings are following right along in the same kind of process that has historically been the process of the Senate. So then the argument is made that, well, this is an election year, and the Republicans said uh, back in 2016 that in an election year they wouldn't move forward with then-President Obama's nomination. What are the facts? A vacancy has arisen in a presidential election year 29 times. Every single one, and this is important to note, every single one of those 29 times, whoever was the sitting president made a nomination to replace the vacancy, to, to fill the vacancy. Every one of those 29 times. 19 of those 29 times, the parties of the president and the Senate majority were the same. And 17 of those 19 nominees were confirmed. By contrast, of the 10 times in which the Senate was controlled by the party opposite to the president, only one time did the Senate that was not of the party of the president proceed to fill that vacancy. In fact, 
Vacancies under a divided government, meaning, meaning a Senate and a presidency from different parties, have not been filled for over 130 years, going back to 1888. So much like when the Senate exercised its constitutional right, fully consistent with precedent in 2016, not to, fulfill the, to fill the vacancy when there was divided government, the Senate is today exercising its duty to move forward with processing this nomination, just like the vast majority of Senates in the past have done every time this has happened. And it's important to note that. Any claim that this process is unusual or that it violates the clear precedent of the Senate is simply false. So then, back to the attacks on the members of this uh, committee on the Republican side, and frankly against the President, it says that we're trying to engage in court packing. Now, that's a novel one because it's actually the Senate following standard procedure with regard to a vacancy that is now being accused of being court packing, when my colleagues on the other side are actually proposing court packing. That is, to statu statutorily and with the signature of a president, change the law so that they can add more members to the court. FDR tried this, and his effort was rejected. That effort should be rejected now, but let's be clear about it. This is not court packing. That threatening to pass a law and change the court is court packing. So then what were the arguments that were actually leveled against Judge Barrett? Well, the standard arguments. She is going to overturn all protections for women. She is going to change all of the laws in the country that uh, protect people's health care. And everyone in this country who has a pre-existing condition or has any kind of a worry about getting support uh, needs to worry that she's going to be an activist judge and go a justice and go in there and change the law. She's not, and we all know that. This is simply the tired, worn out argument that is constantly made every time a Republican president nominates a candidate for the bench for the, for the Supreme Court of the United States. And the, it's never been true, and it will not be true with Judge Barrett. Uh, so then the attack is, well, the Republicans don't care about people's health. They won't even try to get COVID relief out. And we're here in a hearing in the Judiciary Committee when we ought to be passing COVID relief legislation. And I've heard several of my colleagues basically say the Republicans are refusing to work on helping to address the COVID crisis. This coming from colleagues who just a month or so ago voted unanimously to filibuster a 600, five to $600 billion COVID relief package in the Senate. A COVID relief package, I asked my staff to get me a quick summary of it, that, that put, as I indicated, somewhere between five and $600 billion into more small business loans, unemployment insurance, uh, agriculture and farming assistance, postal service assistance, uh, education assistance, both at the higher education levels and at K through 12, healthcare assistance for uh, pandemic preparation for uh, strategic stockpiles, for testing, for contact tracing, uh, billions for vaccine and therapeutic and diagnostic development, and the list goes on. We were stopped from proceeding with this legislation by a filibuster of those who now accuse us of not wanting to try to do something. We stand ready if you'll simply let us go to the legislation and pass it. So now, Judge Barrett, let me talk about you. Judge, you have an exemplary academic record and legal credentials, and you are preeminently qualified to serve on our Supreme Court. Following your graduation from law school, you clerked for both the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, at the Supreme Court, you clerked, as everyone knows, for none other than the late Justice Antonin Scalia. Upon receiving your nomination to the Supreme Court, Judge Barrett 
reflected on her clerkship for Justice Scalia, citing his incalculable influence on her life. She also stated that his judicial philosophy is hers too, and that a judge must apply the law as written. That's what we need in our next Supreme Court justice. Rather than the activist justice that you are being accused of, of, going, uh, of being, judges are not policy makers, and they, are, they must be resolute in setting aside policy views that they may hold. And I know you know that. Should we not take Judge Barrett at her word? As a judge, Supreme Court or otherwise, she must be dedicated to interpreting the law as written with an unparalleled commitment to our Constitution. I've visited with her privately. I've reviewed her record. I have seen nothing that would indicate that she is not telling the truth when she says that is her view of how a judge should conduct herself. I've met with a number of Supreme Court nominees in my service in the Senate, and throughout I've continued to maintain an emphasis on following the law and upholding our Constitution, and that that must be a central characteristic of the justices we select for this highly influential part of our, our government. Judges have a great responsibility to carefully exercise their authority within the limits of the law. Our court system has the responsibility to preserve our constitutional rights, ensure a limited government, and provide speedy and fair justice. Following her clerkships, Judge Barrett spent time in private practice before beginning her tenure as a professor. Her academic scholarship and lengthy analysis of issues facing the federal courts make her uniquely well qualified to serve on our nation's highest court. In particular, Judge Barrett's thoughtful exploration of the precedent and the doctrine of stare decisis demonstrates that she is both intellectual and deliberative in her understanding of the law. Moreover, it's evident that she understands the role of a fair and proper judge. In September 2017, Judge Amy Coney Barrett came before the Senate Judiciary Committee, this committee, after being nominated to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. During that hearing, she repeatedly expressed her commitment to independent and unbiased decision making. I was proud to support her confirmation to the Court of Appeals in both the committee and on the Senate floor. Judge Barrett's remarkable resume shows she is a pioneer in the legal field. She will be the fifth woman and the first mother of school-aged children to serve on the Supreme Court. In many ways, she's the ideal candidate to fill this current vacancy. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing more from the nominee about her experience and her judicial philosophy. The next few days will prove invaluable as we discuss with Judge Barrett at length the proper role of a judge in our legal system. I look forward to this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I believe uh, <coughs> Senator Harris. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hello? We hear you. Chairman, uh, this hearing has brought together uh, more than well, just, people. Just, uh, just uh, uh, front hours. Uh, Senator, yes. Uh, just wait just one second. We don't see you. Of course. Well. You don't see me. Uh, one congratulations on being on the ticket. I hadn't told you that. There we go. Can you see me now? Mr. Chairman, can you see me? Can you hear me? I, I see you. I hear you. The floor is yours. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this hearing has brought together more than 50 people to sit inside of a closed door room for hours while our nation is facing a deadly airborne virus. This committee has ignored common sense requests to keep people safe, including not requiring testing for all members, despite a coronavirus outbreak among senators of this very committee. By contrast, in response to this recent Senate outbreak, the leaders of Senate Republicans rightly postponed business on the Senate floor this week to protect the health and safety of senators and staff. Mr. Chairman, for the same reasons, this hearing should have been postponed. The decision to hold this hearing now is reckless and places facilities workers, janitorial staff, and congressional aides and Capitol Police at risk. Not to mention that while tens of millions of Americans are struggling to pay their bills, the Senate should be prioritizing 
coronavirus relief and providing financial support to those families. The American people need to, to have help to make rent or their mortgage payment. We should provide financial assistance to those who have lost their job and help parents put food on the table. Small businesses need help, as do the cities, towns, and hospitals that this crisis has pushed to the brink. The House bill would help families and small businesses get through this crisis. But Senate Republicans have not lifted a finger for 150 days, which is how long that bill has been here in the Senate um, to move the bill. Yet, this committee is determined to rush a Supreme Court confirmation hearing through in just 16 days. Senate Republicans have made it crystal clear that rushing a Supreme Court nomination is more important than helping and supporting the American people who are suffering from a deadly pandemic and a devastating economic crisis. Their priorities are not the American people's priorities. But for the moment, Senate Republicans hold a majority in the Senate and determine the schedule. So here we are. The Constitution of the United States entrusts the Senate with the solemn duty to carefully consider nominations for lifetime appointments to the United States Supreme Court. Yet the Senate majority is rushing this process and jamming President Trump's nominee through the Senate while people are actually voting just 22 days before the end of the election. More than 9 million Americans have already voted and millions more will vote while this illegitimate committee process is underway. A clear majority of Americans want whomever wins this election to fill this seat. And my Republican colleagues know that. Yet they are deliberately defying the will of the people in their attempt to roll back the rights and protections provided under the Affordable Care Act. And let's remember, in 2017, President Trump and congressional Republicans repeatedly tried to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. But remember, people from all walks of life spoke out and demanded Republicans stop trying to take away the American people's health care. Republicans finally realized that the Affordable Care Act is too popular to repeal in Congress. So now they are trying to bypass the will of the voters and have the Supreme Court do their dirty work. That's why President Trump promised to only nominate judges who will get rid of the Affordable Care Act. This administration, with the support of Senate Republicans, will be in front of the Supreme Court on November 10th to argue that the entire Affordable Care Act should be struck down. That's in 29 days that that'll happen. And that's a big reason why Senate Republicans are rushing this process. They are trying to get a justice onto the court in time to ensure they can strip away the protections of the Affordable Care Act. And if they succeed, it will result in millions of people losing access to health care at the worst possible time in the middle of a pandemic. 23 million Americans could lose their health insurance altogether. If they succeed, they will eliminate protections for 135 million Americans with pre existing conditions like diabetes and asthma, heart disease, or cancer. A list that now will include over 7 million Americans who have contracted COVID 19. Insurance companies could deny you coverage or could sell you a plan that won't pay a dime toward treating anything related to your pre-existing condition. If the Affordable Care Act is struck down, you will have to once again pay for things like mammograms and cancer screenings and birth control. Seniors will pay more for prescription drugs and young adults will be kicked off of their parents' plans. And these are not abstract issues. We need to be clear about how overturning the Affordable Care Act will impact the people we all represent. For example, Micah, who is 11 years old and she lives in Southern California. So Micah enjoys being a Girl Scout and ice skating and reading and eating pasta and baking. Her mother says the only reason Micah is able to live her life as she does now is because the Affordable Care Act guarantees that her health insurance cannot deny her coverage 
or limit her care because it's too expensive. You see, Micah has a congenital heart defect. She goes to multiple specialists throughout the year and gets an MRI with anesthesia every six months. At just 11 months old, Micah's family had already hit $50,000 in medical expenses and her biannual MRI cost were $15,000 a session. And so correction, she by, by 11 months old, her family had hit $500,000 in medical expenses. If Republicans succeed in striking down the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies will be able to deny coverage for children with serious conditions. Children like Micah. And parents, well, they'll be on their own. No one should face financial ruin to get their child or their spouse or their parent the care they need. And no family should be kept from seeing a doctor or getting treatment because an insurance company says that the treatment is too expensive. In America, access to health care should not be determined based on how much money you have. Health care and access to health care should be a right. Micah and millions of others who are protected by the Affordable Care Act know this is fundamentally what is at stake with this Supreme Court nomination. And of course, there's more at stake. Throughout our history, Americans have brought cases to the United States Supreme Court in our ongoing fight for civil rights, human rights, and equal justice. Decisions like Brown versus Board of Education, which opened up educational opportunities for black boys and girls. Roe versus Wade, which recognized a woman's right to control her own body. Loving v. Virginia and Obergefell v. Hodges, which recognized that love is love and that marriage equality is the law of the land. The United States Supreme Court is often the last refuge for equal justice when our constitutional rights are being violated. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg devoted her life to fight for equal justice, and she defended the Constitution. She advocated for human rights and equality. She stood up for the rights of women. She protected workers. She fought for the rights of consumers against big corporations. She supported LGBTQ rights, and she did so much more. But now, her legacy and the rights she fought so hard to protect are in jeopardy. By replacing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, with someone who will undo her legacy, President Trump is attempting to roll back Americans' rights for decades to come. Every American must understand that with this nomination, equal justice under law is at stake. Our voting rights are at stake. Workers' rights are at stake. Consumer rights are at stake. The right to a safe and legal abortion is at stake. And holding corporations accountable is at stake. And again, there's so much more. So, Mr. Chairman, I do believe this hearing is a clear attempt to jam through a Supreme Court nominee who will take health care away from millions of people during a deadly pandemic that has already killed more than 214,000 Americans. I believe we must listen to our constituents and protect their access to health care and wait to confirm a new Supreme Court justice until after Americans decide who they want in the White House. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harris. Uh, Senator Kennedy. You, uh, you have a beautiful family, Judge. Um, we, uh, we claim you in Louisiana. We're proud of the fact in Louisiana that you were born in, uh, in Metairie, a suburb of New Orleans. Well, we're proud of the fact that uh, you got a solid education at St. Mary's Dominican High School. Come back and visit us. Um, I know your mom and dad still live there. And uh, uh, we're, we're, we're very proud of you and your career. Um, this is a solemn occasion, as it should be. I can't think of 
another position, at least not a position that uh, is for life, not a position in which the occupant is not elected by the people, uh, that is more powerful, at least not in the Western world, than an associate justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, and this process is not supposed to be the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Our job is to advise and consent. And that's a, a one way of saying that we're supposed to make sure that the president hasn't, any whatever president makes the nomination, hasn't made a mistake. And we all, as you can see, take that job seriously as, as a, uh, as you can see, and we know you respect that. Uh, that's why um, I think over the next several days, it's appropriate for us to talk about your intellect, which is obvious, by the way, and your temperament, your character, and your judicial philosophy. And, and I hope we can talk about something else. And, and uh, that's the role of the federal judiciary in, in American life. Now, look, Judge, I'm not naive. I understand this thing can turn sour real fast. We all watched the hearings for Justice Kavanaugh. It was a freak show. It, it, it looked like the... the, the the cantina bar scene out of Star Wars. And I know, for someone unaccustomed to it, that it hurts to be called a racist. I think it's one of the worst things you can call an American. I know that it hurts to be called a white colonialist. And I know it must hurt for someone of deep Christian faith like yourself to be called a religious bigot and to have it implied that because you are a devout Christian that you're somehow unfit for public service. Uh, before it's over with, they may call you Rosemary's baby for all I know. I hope not. Um, and, and I know, as we've seen this morning, I know you think it's unfair, it is unfair, for my colleagues to suggest, uh, some overtly, some more indirectly, that if you're put on the United States Supreme Court, you will be on a mission from God to deny health care coverage for pre-existing con uh, conditions for every American. I, I know that seems preposterous to you, and it seems that way because it is. Um, take comfort in the fact that the American people, some of my colleagues disagree with the state. They believe in government. I believe in people. The American people are not morons. They can, they can, they can uh, see dribble, drivel when they see it, and they can appreciate it when they see it for being what it is. Now, let me, let me turn to what I hope quickly we can, we can talk about today. Americans love democracy. Um, we'll even fight for it, and we have. And that's a wonderful thing. It's an important thing in today's world as this world becomes more authoritarian. And, and our founders, but we don't, ha we don't have a pure democracy as, as a, a, a columnist I read this morning said, we don't, when we have to decide a complex issue dealing with, with social norms or economic issues, we don't all put on a toga and go down to the forum and vote. We, we have elected representatives. Those are members of Congress. And it is our elected representatives' job to decide social and economic policy. Um, and if we don't like what they do, they're accountable. We vote them out. But in the last 50 years, certainly in the last 25, the United States Congress, either voluntarily or involuntarily, has ceded a lot of its power to the executive branch and to the federal judiciary. Um, 
when I say the executive branch, I'm not necessarily talking about the president. I'm talking about the administrative state. The, the bureaucracy, as some call it. It's this, it's this giant rogue beast that enjoys power now that only kings once enjoyed. Um, members of the administrative state write their own laws. They interpret their own laws. Um, they litigate their own laws in their own courts before judges that they appoint. And Congress has allowed that to happen. I think Congress has also abdicated a lot of power to the federal judiciary. I do. And I, I'm not saying that federal judges don't make law. Of course they make law. They make law in the context of a specific case. It's called judicial precedent. But our founders intended federal judges to exercise judicial restraint and to understand the special role, scope, and mission of the federal judiciary vis-a-vis -vis the United States Congress. I don't think our founders intended uh, uh, judges to be politicians in robes. I think our founders intended judges, federal judges, to tell us what the law is, not what the law ought to be. Um, I think our founders intended, as the Chief Justice put it, I think our founders intended federal judges to call balls and strikes. I don't think our founders intended for federal judges to be able to redraw the strike zone. Um, I don't think our founders in intended for judges to be politicians in robes. Politicians, you don't want the United States Supreme Court to turn into this. Trust me, um, politicians get to vote their preferences under our democracy. Judges do not. Judges do not. And finally, unlike some of my colleagues, I don't think our founders intended the United States Supreme Court to become a mini Congress. I don't think our founders intended members of the United States Supreme Court to try to rewrite our statutes are the United States Constitution every other Thursday because they, to prosecute a, a social or an economic agenda that they can't get by the voters. And that goes on in America every day. We've reached the point where one single solitary federal judge in a limited venue can enjoin a federal statute or an executive order of the President of the United States for the entire country. And our founders never intended that. I, I want to close with, 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 with two very short quotations. Uh, the first, stated much more elo eloquently than I can, is Justice Curtis in 1857. You've probably read it. He was dissenting in the Dred Scott case. This is what Judge Curtis said. When a strict interpretation of the Constitution, according to the fixed rules which govern the interpretation of laws, is abandoned, and the theoretical opinions of individuals are allowed to control its meaning, we have no longer a Constitution. We're under the government of individual men who for the time being have power to declare what their constitution is according to their own views of what it ought to mean. And finally, a more contemporary statement from a gentleman that you're very familiar with, Justice Scalia. He said it in real world terms. This is what he said. The American people love democracy, and the American people are not fools. The American people know their value judgments are quite as good as those taught in any law school. Maybe better. Value judgments, after all, should be voted on, not dictated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Barrett, congratulations to you and to your family. I'm delighted to see that they are back in the room. And I'm thrilled 
that they are here with us today. You know, we have had 164 American citizens come before this committee for nomination to the Supreme Court. And today is the fifth time that we have had a female judge come before us. So we welcome you. And I will say this. Unfortunately, it's neither rare nor remarkable to see the kind of performances my Democratic colleagues have put on today. What they're trying to do is to convince the American people that they should be terrified of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. If you listen closely to their full statements, it betrays their true intent. If you go back through the transcript, you're going to find not a coherent legal counterargument, but a panicked stump speech on behalf of their controversial platform. Rather than reviewing your judicial philosophies, they're instead choosing to project their own desires and their fears onto the American people. It sounds as if they are trying to create a panic. They decided to drum up indignation over the fact that you dared to present a counter-argument against the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Apparently, a difference of opinion between two brilliant jurists who often disagree is just too much for them. The rhetoric is unsettling, but after listening to them, I worry more about its underpinnings because my colleagues' remarks have displayed their troubling belief that nothing but an activist judiciary will do for them. Given your track record, you'd think that my colleagues would jump at the opportunity to support a successful female legal superstar who is highly regarded by both her Democratic and Republican colleagues and who is a working mom. But as today's increasingly paternalistic and frankly disrespectful arguments have shown, if they had their way, only certain kinds of women would be allowed into this hearing room. On that note, not so long ago in another hearing, they scrutinized your commitment to your Catholic faith and tried to use that as a way to question your competency and your professionalism. They know that that is unconstitutional. The Constitution forbids it. You are a brilliant jurist and a constitutional law expert. You will be an intellectual powerhouse on the Supreme Court, and you will steer the panel's focus toward textualism and originalism as rightful guiding philosophies. I love Justice Scalia's definition of textualism. Textualism in its present form begins and ends with what the text says and fairly implies. He goes on to defend textualism and explains that this method can lead to both conservative and liberal outcomes. Similarly, originalism doesn't always lead a jurist down the path they'd most like to follow. This method of interpretation holds that the meaning of a legal document, such as the Constitution, remains fixed, even when applied over time to new questions. Staying true to these guidelines requires more study and patience than other methods that allow judges to reinvent the law or be activist when things get tricky. Since taking the bench, I appreciate that you have written over 100 opinions and have participated in over 900 appeals where you have applied this complex reasoning. Thank you for that. We know that you are a prolific scholar and author of over a dozen articles on the courts and the Constitution. The ABA has rated you as well qualified to serve as a Supreme Court justice. I appreciate that many times you've probably done this with the child in your arms, on your hip, or somewhere in tow, maybe waiting for a ball game to begin. 
You have done all of this as you have been a friend, a mentor, a wife, and a mom. These are impressive qualifications by any standard. So it is no surprise that you are fielding attacks from other angles. Many of my colleagues have wasted a lot of their time complaining that the process in an effort to delay and obstruct a legitimate, constitutionally sound confirmation hearing. Let's not forget, it was the Democrats who took an ax to process in 2018 when they dropped last minute unsubstantiated sexual assault allegations against Justice Kavanaugh. We still don't have the full story of, about their level and manner of coordination with activists and mainstream media outlets, but what we do know is that they turned that confirmation into a circus. And on that note, it is hard to take seriously their complaints about moving too quickly. We've heard about the timeline for Justice O'Connor, 33 days, Justice Ginsburg, 43 days. And just a word on Justice Ginsburg, whose seat we are filling. She was indeed a role model for many because she fought to open more doors for women in the law and beyond. And I sincerely hope that I am as effective an advocate in the Senate as she was on the court. We know from studying American history that women have had to always fight for a seat at the table. This goes back to Abigail Adams, who urged her husband, John, to please remember the ladies in their fight for independence. And we know it took 150 years for women to get that right to vote. But the Constitution allowed for that amendment process. Unfortunately, what we see today is that radical activists would like nothing more than to take a hatchet to process. Their favorite play is confronting the American people with the supposed illegitimacy of the Constitution. They argue that our founders' flaws, and yes, they were flawed. They are all humans are. That the flaws invalidate the principles that bind this country together. This betrays a dangerously naive understanding of the point and purpose of our founding legal document. The timeless principles contained in that document were written to protect individual rights absolutely. These principles, of course, include the separation of powers and federalism in our government, a system of checks and balances that prevents encroachment by one branch or another. If Congress acts beyond the scope of its legislative authority or the president grows too power hungry, the judiciary has the authority to rein that branch back in. And if the vast bureaucracy dares to overregulate, states and their citizens have the right to stand up and challenge that overreach as being beyond the scope of federal power. Together, the separation of powers and federalism have protected our republic from falling into the hands of tyrants. But keep in mind that the founders despised the tyranny of British rule just as much as they despised the whims of the mob. Flash forward to today, when American exceptionalism is under bitter attack from yet another mob. While most Americans take pride in our heritage, a vocal minority finds fault at every turn. They demand to know, can we still call the Constitution a relevant, valid source of law, even if no women or people of color participated in the drafting? Are the principles in that document still capable of curbing abuses of power and safeguarding freedom? Can we have faith that the future of democracy remains strong despite a summer of looting and violence in the streets? The answer to each is yes. And over the next few days, I expect that you, Judge Barrett, will explain why. So many families are watching today, and we're all going to be listening. Thank you for appearing before us. We look forward to your answers. Thanks, Senator Blackburn. I have uh, two letters I'd like to submit for the record, one from the architect of the Capitol, showing that the room is CDC compliant, and we'll introduce that. 
And we do have the ABA rating regarding Judge Barrett. I'll introduce it in the record, but it's fairly short, so I'll just read it if that's okay. The American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary has completed its evaluation of the, of the professional qualifications of Judge Amy Coney Barrett, who has been nominated by, President, by the President to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. As you know, the Standing Committee confines its evaluation to the qualities of integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament. A substantial majority of the Standing Committee determined that Judge Barrett is well qualified, and a minority is of the opinion that she is qualified to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. The, Jamar the majority rating represents the Standing Committee's official rating. Enter that into the record. Now we have a- Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could you explain what CDC compliant means? It means that the room is set up uh, social distancing regarding the virus that the architect of the Capitol measured the, the space. And as to me, I was tested a week ago Friday, had brief contact with Senator Lee, I was negative. I've been told by Senator Moynihan and a physician in South Carolina, uh, I, there's no requirement to test me, I feel fine. My exposure is not such that I should be quarantined or tested. Anybody that wants to get tested, they can. And I made a decision <clears throat> to try to make the room as safe as possible, but to come to work. Well, millions of Americans are going to work today. Somebody may have tested positive in a restaurant, a military unit, uh, a fire department, or a police department. Uh, you make it as safe as possible, you manage the risk, and you go to work. I'm not going to be told to be tested by political opponents. I'm going to be tested as an individual when the CDC requires it. I think we can safely conduct this hearing. We have. And I think it's been off, it's off to a good start. So I do care about everybody's safety. But as a lot of Americans out there, we have to go to work. And you can't demand not to show up to work unless everybody you may come in contact with is tested whether they need to or not. And we're not going to do that here. Uh, now we have a panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our, thank you, Senator Kennedy, for that question. We have three people, our two colleagues from Indiana, uh, Senator Todd Young and Senator Mike Brahm. Uh, I know Louisiana uh, adopts uh, our, our judge here, but she is uh, living now in Indiana. And the third is uh, Professor Patricia O'Hara, who I'd like to briefly introduce. Professor O'Hara is Professor Emerite, I hope I got that right, of law at Notre Dame Law School. She has served on the faculty for 40 years. She first arrived in Notre Dame in 1971 as, the as a first-year law student. She graduated summa cum laude and first in her class in 1974. Described as the heart and soul of Notre Dame for over 40 years by current Notre Dame law dean G. Marcus Cole, Professor O'Hara, O'Hara's career at Notre Dame was that of a trailblazer. She was the first woman to graduate first in her class from Notre Dame the first woman appointed by the Board of Trustees to serve as an officer of the university as Vice President for Student Affairs and the first woman to serve as Dean of the Law School. So with that, we'll start with Senator Todd. I think all these individuals are remote. Senator Todd? Todd Young? Well, thank you, Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Feinstein, and members of the committee. Today, I join you in the shadow of Monument Circle in Indianapolis, Indiana. I am honored to appear before you to introduce Judge Amy Coney Barrett, a remarkable Hoosier poised to make her mark on our country. She truly is an American original. In 2017, when there was an opening on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, my office began looking for an extraordinary American who would uphold the rule of law. In response, we received dozens of applications from many of the finest legal minds in the state of Indiana. My staff and I began researching in earnest to learn everything we could about each candidate to determine who among them would make the best judge. And I interviewed the best of the best. One of those was a constitutional law professor from the University of Notre Dame by the name of Amy Coney Barrett. I first met with then Professor Barrett in the spring of 2017, and it was abundantly clear that she was a star. 
A brilliant legal scholar, she was and is held in the highest regard by her peers in the legal world. Her integrity and character are unimpeachable. She's a model of collegiality and fairness. And simply, she possessed all of the necessary qualities to be a great appellate court judge then and to be a great Supreme Court justice now. My colleague, former Senator Joe Donnelly and I approved of her nomination and a hearing was set. Unfortunately, some resorted to attacks on Judge Barrett's religious convictions. I can tell you that in Indiana and much of the country, faith is viewed as an asset in a public servant, not a liability. As Notre Dame President Father Jenkins reminded us then, being a person of faith doesn't interfere with one's ability to apply the law. Thankfully, Judge Barrett's qualifications outshone personal attacks, and she was confirmed by a bipartisan majority to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. As a member of that court, Judge Barrett's proven that she is a rather brilliant jurist who interprets the Constitution as written and carefully weighs the facts of a given case. She's heard more than 600 cases on the Seventh Circuit and authored nearly 100 opinions. And I should note, she is the first woman from Indiana ever to serve on that esteemed court. During that Seventh Circuit interview back in 2017, it was obvious that Judge Barrett loved the law and the Constitution. Her love for her family, her husband Jesse and their seven children was also clear. If confirmed, Judge Barrett will be the fifth woman and the first mother of school-aged children to serve as a Supreme Court justice. Now, being a parent doesn't qualify one to sit on the Supreme Court but it does give us Hoosiers yet another reason to be proud of Amy Coney Barrett and the trail she's blazed leading her to this moment. Education, faith, family, community, equal justice under the law. These are all values that Midwesterners hold dear. Indeed, they are values that Americans hold dear and they are all values embodied by Judge Barrett. Author Kurt Vonnegut, another American original from Indiana, once said, I don't know what it is about Hoosiers, but wherever you go, there's always a Hoosier doing something very important. Where Amy Coney Barrett has gone, she has always been doing something very important. From raising a family, to educating the next generation of scholars, to administering justice on the Court of Appeals. It's my hope that this body will confirm Judge Barrett in a bipartisan fashion so that we will soon find another Hoosier doing something very important on the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator DeYoung. Uh, Senator Braun, is, did we, were we able to connect with him? We we're having some technical problems. We're good? Senator Braun. Mike, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Chairman Graham? Hey, Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Feinstein, it's an honor for me to join Senator Young and Professor Emerita O'Hara to introduce a fellow Hoosier who makes our state proud. I'm doing this from my hometown, Jasper, Indiana, at City Hall, literally, and we're on Main Street. And figuratively, from a place, town, state, that represents a broad cross-section of our country. In 2013, Justice Antonin Scalia wrote that the federal judiciary is hardly a cross-section of America. Today, it's still easy to see what he meant. When confirmed, Amy Coney Barrett would become the only justice of the Supreme Court who spent the majority of her professional life in middle America, not on the East Coast. When confirmed, she will be the only sitting justice who did not receive her law degree from Harvard or Yale. Yet her Notre Dame law credentials are also from a first-rate university. When confirmed, 
she will be only the second current justice to join the court from west of the nation's capital. When this vacancy arose, I was the first to voice my support for a nominee from the Midwest because I believe we need more judges who understand those Midwestern values that guide our lives, faith, family, community, and respect for the law. Amy Coney Barrett is that quintessential Midwesterner, hardworking, generous, humble. She's a top flight law scholar who's just as comfortable at the Saturday morning tailgate as she is in the ivory tower, a legal titan who drives a minivan. I immediately supported Judge Barrett's nomination, not only because she is a highly qualified jurist, but because she's proven both on and off the bench that she has a decency and fundamental respect for our country and its constitution to serve honorably. And now I'd like to say a word about faith. Much will certainly be made in the coming days of Judge Barrett's Catholic faith and how she practices it. It's a faith that I and many Americans share. Our founders anticipated this question and as they so often do, got it right. Liberals and conservatives alike are bound by the Constitution's firm edict that no religious test should ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. I believe hostility toward Judge Barrett's religious beliefs today could set a dangerous precedent of hostility toward other religious beliefs tomorrow. Judge Barrett has been clear in her public life where she falls on the question of faith and the law. As she concluded in a 1998 essay, we're sure to hear cherry picked over the next few weeks, judges cannot, nor should they try to, align our legal system with the church's moral teaching whenever the two diverge. Faith is very important to most Americans. And I agree that faith should be a key word in Judge Barrett's confirmation. But I believe the most important question of faith should be, is she willing to faithfully interpret the Constitution? Judge Barrett's record shows that she will. Throughout her nearly 100 written opinions on the appellate court, Judge Barrett has proven that she is a strong constitutional originalist who will not cut the American people out of their own government by treating the Supreme Court as a third chamber of Congress. On the bench, her qualifications are beyond question. Off the bench, she exemplifies the generosity and character Hoosiers are known for. And she has lived a life rooted in those heartland values I mentioned before. Faith, family, community, and respect for the law. Hoosiers should be proud to have Amy Coney Barrett serving and representing our state currently. And I believe she will make all Americans proud as a justice of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Professor O'Hara. Professor? Is the professor with us? Professor, could you uh, count to 10, please? Could you speak? If you can hear me. <clears throat> Professor O'Hara, if you can speak up. Do you hear me? Please speak up. OK. I don't know. She must be in the 3G part of Indiana. Can photograph him? Uh, can, 
Can, see if we're in contact with her at all. Is it working? Professor, could you speak up, please? You need to unmute your mic, I've been told, Professor O'Hara. How did she do that? <laughs> Put a quarter in it, I don't know. <laughs> You're not going to give us a quarter, I know that. Can she hear us? Well, I'm, I'm afraid we have technical difficulties, and um, I guess what we'll do now, if you can fix them in the next 30 seconds, let me know. If not, uh, Judge Barrett, we will hear from you. Any progress with uh, Professor O'Hara? Okay, Judge, if you don't mind, you can take your mask off, please. Raise your right hand, stand up, please. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Welcome to the committee, to your family. Y'all have uh, done a great job over there. Uh, the floor is yours, Judge. Ranking Member Feinstein and members of the committee, I'm honored and humbled to appear before you today as a nominee for Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. I thank the President for entrusting me with this profound responsibility, as well as for the graciousness that he and the First Lady have shown my family throughout this process. I thank Senator Young for introducing me, as he did at my hearing, to serve on the Seventh Circuit. And I also thank Senator Braun for his support. And while she could not be with us via uh, the satellite, I am also grateful to former Dean Patty O'Hara of the Notre Dame Law School. She hired me as a professor nearly 20 years ago, and she has been a mentor, colleague, and friend ever since. I thank the members of this committee and your other colleagues in the Senate who have taken the time to meet with me since my nomination. It's been a privilege to meet you. As I said when I was nominated to serve as a justice, I'm used to being in a group of nine, my family. Nothing is more important to me, and I'm very proud to have them behind me. My husband, Jesse, and I have been married for 21 years. He has been a selfless and wonderful partner every step of the way. I once asked my sister, why do you think marriage is hard? People are always saying that. I think it's easy. And she looked at me and said, well, maybe you should ask Jesse if he agrees with that. <laughs> I decided not to take her advice because I know that I am far luckier in love than I deserve. Jesse and I are parents to seven wonderful children. Our oldest daughter, Emma, is a sophomore in college who just might follow her parents into a career in the law. Next is Vivian, who came to us from Haiti. When Vivian arrived, she was so weak that we were told she might never talk or walk normally. But now she deadlifts as much as the male athletes in our gym, and I assure you she has no trouble talking. Tess is 16, and while she shares her parents' love for the liberal arts, she also has a math gene that seems to have skipped her parents' generation. John Peter joined us shortly after the devastating earthquake in Haiti. And Jesse, who brought him home, still describes the shock on JP's face when he got off the plane in wintertime Chicago. Once that shock wore off, JP assumed the happy-go-lucky attitude that is still his signature trait. Liam is smart, strong, and kind. And to our delight, he still loves watching movies with mom and dad. 
Ten-year-old Juliet is already pursuing her goal of becoming an author by writing multiple essays and short stories, one of which she recently submitted for publication. And our youngest, Benjamin, um, is at home with friends. Benjamin has Down syndrome, and he is the unanimous favorite of the family. He was watching the hearing this morning, I'm told, and he was calling out our names as he saw the kids in the back. My own siblings are here, some in the hearing room and some nearby. Carrie, Megan, Eileen, Amanda, Vivian, and Michael are my oldest and dearest friends. We've seen each other through both the happy and hard parts of life, and I am so grateful that they are with me now. My parents, Mike and Linda Coney, are watching from their New Orleans home. My father was a lawyer and my mother was a teacher, which explains why I became a law professor. More important, my parents modeled for me and my six siblings a life of service, principle, faith, and love. I remember preparing for a grade school spelling bee against a boy in my class, and to boost my confidence, my dad saying, anything boys can do, girls can do better. And at least as I remember it, I spelled my way to victory. I received similar encouragement from the devoted teachers at St. Mary's Dominican, my all-girls high school in New Orleans. When I went to college, it never occurred to me that anyone would consider girls less capable than boys. My freshman year, I took a literature class filled with upperclassmen English majors. And when I did my first presentation, which was on breakfast at Tiffany's, I feared I had failed. But my professor took the time to talk to me. She filled me with confidence about how well I had done, and she became a mentor. And when I graduated with a degree in English, she gave me Truman Capote's collected works as a gift. Although I considered graduate studies in English, I decided that my passion for words was better suited to deciphering statutes than novels. I was fortunate to have wonderful legal mentors, in particular, the judges for whom I clerked. The legendary Judge Lawrence Silberman of the DC Circuit gave me my first job in the law, and he continues to teach me today. He was by my side during my Seventh Circuit hearing he swore me in at my investiture, and he's cheering me on from his living room right now. I also clerked for Justice Scalia. And like many law students, I felt like I knew the justice before I ever met him, because I had read so many of his colorful, accessible opinions. More than the style of his writing, though, it was the content of Justice Scalia's reasoning that shaped me. His judicial philosophy was straightforward. A judge must apply the law as it is written, not as she wishes it were. Sometimes that approach meant reaching results that he did not like. But as he put it in one of his best known opinions, that is what it means to say that we have a government of laws and not of men. Justice Scalia taught me more than just law. He was devoted to his family, resolute in his beliefs, and fearless of criticism. And as I embarked on my own legal career, I resolved to maintain that same perspective. There's a tendency in our profession to treat the practice of law as all-consuming while losing sight of everything else. But that makes for a shallow and unfulfilling life. I worked hard as a lawyer and as a professor. I owed that to my clients, to my students, and to myself. But I never let the law define my identity or crowd out the rest of my life. A similar principle applies to the role of courts. Courts have a vital responsibility to the rule of law, which is critical to a free society. But courts are not designed to solve every problem or right every wrong in our public life. The policy decisions and value judgments of government must be made by the political branches, elected by and accountable to the people. The public should not expect courts to do so, and courts should not try. That is the approach that I have strived to follow as a judge on the Seventh Circuit. In every case, I have carefully considered the arguments presented by the parties, discussed the issues with my colleagues on the court, 
and done my utmost to reach the result required by the law, whatever my own preferences might be. I try to remain mindful that while my court decides thousands of cases a year, each case is the most important one to the litigants involved. After all, cases are not like statutes, which are often named for their authors. Cases are named for the parties who stand to gain or lose in the real world, often through their liberty or livelihood. When I write an opinion resolving a case, I read every word from the perspective of the losing party. I ask myself how I would view the decision if one of my children was the party that I was ruling against. Even though I would not like the result, would I understand that the decision was fairly reasoned and grounded in law? That is the standard that I set for myself in every case, and it is the standard that I will follow so long as I am a judge on any court. When the president offered me this nomination, I was deeply honored. But it was not a position I had sought out and I thought carefully before accepting. The confirmation process and the work of serving on the court, if confirmed, requires sacrifices, particularly from my family. I chose to accept the nomination because I believe deeply in the rule of law and the place of the Supreme Court in our nation. I believe Americans of all backgrounds deserve an independent Supreme Court that interprets our Constitution and laws as they are written. And I believe I can serve my country by playing that role. I come before this committee with humility about the responsibility that I have been asked to undertake and with appreciation for those who have come before me. I was nine years old when Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman to sit in this seat. She was a model of grace and dignity throughout her distinguished tenure on the court. When I was 21 years old and just beginning my career, Ruth Bader Ginsburg sat in this seat. She told the committee, what has become of me could only happen in America. I have been nominated to fill Justice Ginsburg's seat, but no one will ever take her place. I will be forever grateful for the path she marked and the life she led. If confirmed, it would be the honor of a lifetime to serve alongside the Chief Justice and seven Associate Justices. I admire them all and would consider each a valued colleague. And I might bring a few new perspectives to the bench. As the President noted when he announced my nomination, I would be the first mother of school-aged children to serve on the court. And I know that it would make Senators Young and Braun happy to know that I would be the first justice to join the court from the Seventh Circuit in 45 years. I would be the only sitting justice who didn't attend school at Harvard or Yale, but I am confident that Notre Dame could hold its own and maybe I could even teach them a thing or two about football. As a final note, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank the many Americans from all walks of life who have reached out with messages of support over the course of my nomination. I believe in the power of prayer and it has been uplifting to hear that so many people are praying for me. I look forward to answering the committee's questions over the coming days. And if I am fortunate enough to be confirmed, I pledge to faithfully and impartially discharge my duties to the American people as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Barrett. Is, uh, let's try Professor O'Hara. Any luck with her? I'm here, Chairman Graham. Thank you. I apologize for the, the problem. Uh, the floor is yours. That's very kind of you. It's, it's anticlimactic because you've already heard from the most important person from whom you need to hear. Uh, but it's very kind of you to take the time. Uh, I have known Judge Amy Coney Barrett for just shy of 20 years. And I want to thank you, the ranking member, uh, Senator Feinstein, the, the distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee, Senator Young and Senator Braun for the opportunity to speak about her here today. Uh, I first came to meet her 
when as Dean of the Law School, together with my colleagues, we recruited her to the faculty in 2002. I was aware of her reputation as a law student, but I had not taught her. So I can well remember that in the initial interview, from my standpoint, I was not thinking of her so much as a Notre Dame alum, but rather as a candidate in whom many law schools would have an interest. Uh, after all, she was first in her class. She was executive editor of the Law Review. She had held two distinguished clerkships for demanding jurists, Judge Lawrence Silverman on the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Justice Antonin Scalia, a short period in private practice at then at Baker Botts and an Olin Fellowship at George Washington University Law School. So from my standpoint as dean in a market in which law schools compete aggressively for candidates with sterling credentials like her, Amy Coney Barrett was a big hit and a big win for us. In the course of the next few years, I was responsible for creating an environment in which she could take her potential and reach the maturation that would be necessary to meet the demanding standards of excellence in scholarship and teaching for promotion to tenure. I want to assure you that it was the easiest task of my entire 10 years as dean. I watched her develop into an exceptional teacher and a superb scholar. Except that I must confess to say watching her develop is a bit of a misnomer because in many ways, Judge Barrett sprang full grown into the legal academy. The first of three distinguished teaching awards that she holds from our students was presented to her by only the second class that she taught. And in my annual visits to observe her classroom teaching, it became clear to me why that was the case. Our students then and now hold her in awe for the power of her intellect and for her consummate professionalism. To read her student teaching evaluations is like reading a thesaurus that only has superlatives in it. Uh, her classes are known for the clarity of the presentation of substantive legal material, but also for open-minded, non-directive discussion, question and answer, respectful of differences and of differences in learning style with our students. Our students strive to meet her high and demanding expectations because they just don't want to disappoint her. Uh, and they greatly appreciate her availability outside the classroom for mentoring and support. At the same time that she was developing and building relationships with our students, she also produced an incredible portfolio of scholarship, superb in both its depth and its quality. Scholars around the academy hold her work in the highest regard. And so when it did come time for her tenure case, I can only tell you without breaching the confidentiality of that process, that it was as easy as a tenure case could possibly be. Her work appears in leading law reviews, University of Chicago, Columbia, Cornell, Virginia, and Texas, to name but a few. I was not surprised in later years when she was tapped for service on the Appellate Advisory Committee on the Federal Appellate Rules of Procedure and elected to the prestigious American Law Institute. And in her three years as a judge on the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, her opinions have been characterized by the same qualities as her scholarship intellectual rigor, painstaking analysis, clarity of legal reasoning and of writing, uh, accompanied by her deep commitment as a jurist to apply the law to the facts of the case before her. Stellar as her professional accomplishments are, no introduction of Professor Barrett is complete without talking about her personal qualities. She's brilliant, but humble, fair and impartial, but empathetic, open-minded and respectful of differences, a skilled listener and able to build consensus, generous, especially to those in need. If I had to describe her in just a few words, I would tell you that Amy Coney Barrett is a woman who leads an integrated life of mind, heart, and soul. And it's that integration that allows her to move so seamlessly uh, between her professional responsibilities and her family commitments. It humbles me now, as it did 12 then, 12 years ago, that I was tasked at one point in my life with evaluating the professional qualifications of Judge Barrett in a university setting. Truth be told, she ran circles around me as a junior faculty member, and in the intervening years, she has left me completely in the dust. And nothing gives me more joy than to be able to say so because this is the standard of excellence that we should demand for institutions of singular importance to us. I have only had two opportunities to communicate with this distinguished committee. 
The first was 10 years ago when I wrote a very strong letter of support for then nominee, now Justice Elena Kagan, whose tenure as Dean of Harvard Law School overlapped with my own tenure as Dean here. The second is today in presenting Amy Coney Barrett to you and endorsing her in equally strong terms. There may be some who would find those two recommendations in juxtaposition, but I find them entirely consistent. Over the course of my 40 years in the legal academy, I've been blessed with the opportunity to meet many Supreme Court justices. As to the justices I've met, while their judicial policy philosophies may differ and their inter interpretive methodologies may differ, what they share is powerful intellects, rigorous work ethics, skilled listening skills, the ability to be open to persuasion and also to persuade themselves, to be fair and impartial. They are people of integrity and they have a commitment to applying the law to the facts of the case before them. They understand that their role as justices is to advance the rule of law, not to advance personal policy preferences. They understand their solemn responsibility to preserve the court as an institution, not wings of the court, the court, a single institution that plays a singular role in our republic. I know firsthand from having worked with closely with Judge Barrett for almost 20 years that she possesses all these same qualifications in abundance. And I trust that over the course of the next few days, with the opportunity to engage in dialogue with her, that you will come to the same conclusion and recommend her for confirmation as an Associate Justice to the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you so much for taking this late opportunity to have me say a few words about Professor Barrett. Thank you very much, Professor O'Hara. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge Barrett, and to your family. Uh, congratulations and welcome. Uh, we're going to have a couple long days ahead. Uh, questions for the record will be due this Friday at 8 o'clock, which is standard practice for the uh, committee. We begin tomorrow, 30-minute rounds, followed by 20-minute rounds. Just do the math. We've got a couple long days ahead of us, so get some rest. Uh, they uh, will be in recess until tomorrow at 9 o'clock.